Hello everyone, I'm Chris Hernandez and this is the Weekly Report, a look at news from the City of Kansas City, Missouri. Be sure to read the new fall edition of Casey Moore, the city's twice a year magazine. We've just mailed the magazine to more than 100,000 households across the city. It's available online as well. This issue features the city's Dollar House program, a new effort to revitalize 18th and Vine, new 911 texting options, as well as an update on the new bike and trail facilities. And of course, we have the annual leaf and brush pickup schedule for your neighborhood. It's on the back cover of the magazine. To read it online, visit kcmo.gov and search KC Moore. The city held its annual citizen budget work sessions over the past few weeks, and it's not too late for you to add your two cents. The city's online engagement tool, also known as our virtual town hall, is kcmomentum.org. It has a new set of questions about how the city council should allocate funding. You can play the pick your priority game at kcmomentum.org. It isn't exactly NYPD blue, but there is a new cop show right here on Channel 2. The Police Board of Commissioners meetings are now being broadcast live thanks to a partnership between the Police Department and our Chief Engineer right here at Channel 2. To help keep the public informed about the work of the Police Department, KCPD upgraded the video system at their headquarters building so that meetings can be shown live each month. As far as the drive-bys, I don't know if it's just the mentality here in our community, uh, it's easy and it's gutless, in my opinion, um, how we how we stop that. You know, I get to I spend a lot of time elsewhere um, and I spend a lot of time with other mayors talking about things that are going on in cities. And number one, I'll tell you is, is that we're not dealing with anything that other cities aren't dealing with. This is not an uncommon story. Um, and they always ask, why aren't you suffering from the same things that other cities are suffering from? The tremendous upheaval and conflict, etc. And one of the things that I can tell them, a couple is, is that I do believe that our community policing, hotspot policing approach is working. I think we can enhance it, but I think it's working to some extent. It requires a lot of change, institutional, cultural, ideological change in order to get from, hey, let's lock them up to, hey, let's talk to them. Uh, but also I think that we have a extremely well-trained uh, police department. The next live broadcast will be November 15th at 10 a.m. Now, these meetings, along with all of our televised meetings, can be viewed on demand at your convenience. Just go to kcmo.gov and search Police Board. Now let's check in with some of our city's departments. Down the toilet or down the drain, when dirty water leaves your house, its next stop is a wastewater pump station. Casey Water operates 39 of them. They receive waste from sewer mains, remove some of the solids, and then pump it to one of Casey Water's wastewater treatment plants. Two of the stations are undergoing significant renovations. They were at least 40, 50 years old um, and had outdated equipment, uh, failing HVAC, failing instrumentation and pumps that were uh, past their useful life cycle and failing, so they had to be rehabbed. The Turkey Creek Wastewater Pump Station has been in service since 1962, and none of the equipment has been replaced since then. So the Water Services Department has been um, band-aiding a lot of the pumps and bar screens. Bon Marie Gardner is the project manager for the work going on now at Turkey Creek. Among the improvements, a new rock box. It collects, you guessed it, rocks, and prevents grit from clogging up the piping and pumps in the station, which could result in costly repairs. A unique feature of this project was ground freezing, which stabilized the ground so the contractor could safely build the rock box. These photos show what the process looked like. Next, new bar screens that essentially rake debris from the water. This is what they find. Be glad you can't smell it. Pumps, Pipes, valves, the electrical system, and HVAC are all being replaced or upgraded. We'll put new equipment in, you, you're hoping you can get at least another 30, 35 years on the equipment without doing major repairs or modifications. Across town, the 87th Street pump station is also getting rehabbed. Morris Ross is the project manager. This 87th Street pump station um, was built in the 80s. Uh, the pumps station itself is in desperate need of repair so 
in order to make sure that people's basements don't flood, don't back up with sewage. We're replacing all of our pumps um, and all the associated equipment so we have a more reliable, more efficient pump station. Improvements here include new bar screens, pumps, electrical and HVAC upgrades, and new slide gates that let the water in. When the work here is completed, which is expected next spring, these pumps will be able to move up to 85 million gallons of sewage a day. That's a 30% increase in capacity. The work is expensive but necessary, explains Wastewater Division Manager Joel Sendra. This is analogous to the family vehicle. It may not have completely failed, but at some point in time you're spending more on maintenance monthly on that vehicle and it's in the shop more than you're using it. This work is being done to upgrade Kansas City's water infrastructure and also as part of the overflow control program, Casey Waters' plan to meet a federal consent decree to reduce sewer overflows in Kansas City's combined and separate sewer systems. water for everything. We use water to make big beautiful ice cubes for for craft cocktails. We use it just for ice water. We use it to blanch vegetables. We use it to make pasta. All things that are actually adding to the flavor. Uh, we use water for almost everything. We couldn't serve cocktails without it. We couldn't make soup without it. We couldn't wash dishes without it. We use it for everything. I boil a lot of water. For instance, I boil my eggs to make egg salad. I boil chicken to make chicken salad. I boil water for certain cake recipes. It's instrumental in operating our business. Clean water and quality water is super important to the taste of our food and for our ability to um, provide this good service. You need water to drink. You need water to wash your face and brush your teeth. It'd be horrible without water. We need it to survive. It is hugely important to have great quality water. Um, you know, I travel all the time and almost every time I drink out of the hotel faucet, I'm like, oh man, it's just not Kansas City water. We, uh, we are here today to uh, celebrate a uh, very important event that occurred to us a few days ago, and that was to place uh, Parks and Boulevard's historic district on the National Register. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the details associated with that. You know, Kansas City has been known, and we use the terminology, a city within a park. This codifies that statement. Uh, basically, August Meyer hired George Kessler to do a plan for the Boulevard and Parkway system in Kansas City. Uh, August Meyer used his own funds to get this thing started. With that, uh, the uh, current uh, hierarchy of the city, including William Rockhill Nelson, Mayor Benjamin Holmes, park board members included August Meyer, Simon B. Armour, William C. Glass, Louis Himmelslaw, and Adrian Van Brunt. If you notice, a lot of those names are very familiar to people in Kansas City by their names and by the mem remembrances of them within our system. So there are contributing features um, that include actually a variety of buildings, structures, fountains, um, and that's actually, there's 41 of them that comprise what is in the historical register. 28 structures, four sites, eight objects, and one building. So we, cha we chose this location today um, looking behind us um, is the August Meyer Memorial. And just standing here and looking at that, we don't really build those anymore. <laughs> um, so it's important that this, that this has happened. And just looking at how um, great that structure is, it's just, it's, it's remarkable. Um, we are truly blessed to have these in Kansas City. The system is really one of our defining brands and uh, it really has been oh, for over a century here. So uh, we have a lot to uh, celebrate here today. As far as the future goes for uh, this listing and the expansion, possible expansions of it, um, I thought I'd answer a few of the questions um, here that you may have. Um, 
this future system can be expanded on. We can include some parks as we go forward, so we can put in Slope Park, we can put in uh, Loose Park if we wanted to, just some examples. We can also include some additional boulevards um, like Gillum, the Paseo, further south here, uh, Meyer Boulevard, Ward Parkway, and Slope Parkway. Well, Nandi's new to our zoo. We're very excited to have him. He is a caracal. You'll see the black tufts on his ears. That's what kind of sets him apart from other animals. Um, previously, we had the serval here, and they are related species, um, but he tends to be in drier areas in Africa and also in the Middle East. Their primary prey is uh, birds, so they're very good at leaping in the air and catching birds out of the air. Uh, he is a young animal. We'll have him here hopefully for several years. He's, he's not yet a year old. Um, when he becomes a breeding age, we're hoping to get a female to pair with him. So possibly we can have some babies. We are having Family Fun Fiesta this weekend. Um, that's going to be on the top side of the zoo, so you'll see special decorations in the Discovery Barn area of the South American exhibit and also in the uh, Tropics building in the South American exhibit there. Nandi, however, is in the African section of the zoo, so you'll see him near the lions in the Lion Kopi area. Janet O'Hagan with Kansas City Convention and Entertainment Facilities, bringing you news of upcoming events taking place at your city facilities. Kansas City's most exciting charity boxing event, Guns and Hoses, powered by the Kansas City Crime Commission, is coming back to the Kansas City Convention Center Grand Ballroom on October 21st. Police officers, firefighters, and EMT paramedics will square off in the ring to see who will reign victorious. All proceeds benefit the Kansas City Crime Commission Surviving Spouse and Family Endowment Fund, providing financial assistance to the spouses and children of those who make the ultimate sacrifice for our safety. Go to KansasCityGunsAndHoses.com for ticketing and event information. The annual Holiday Mart a Kansas City holiday tradition returns to Bartle Hall October 20th through the 23rd. Holiday Mart is the Junior League of Kansas City, Missouri largest fundraiser. This upscale shopping extravaganza has been a fall tradition for 28 years and is an extra special destination event with over 200 specialty retailers and over 20,000 shoppers. For ticketing and additional information about the event, go to www.jlkc.org. On Friday, November 4th, Kansas City Metro Area students from middle school age through college are encouraged to participate in the fifth annual Sleepless in the City project. Sleepless in the City is a private sleepout created to raise awareness to the issues of youth homelessness in Kansas City. During the sleepout, students will gather at the Convention Center's Barney Alice Plaza to practice firsthand how and why people experience homelessness by spending the night outside. Parents, teachers, community leaders, civic leaders, and city officials are encouraged to take part in the event as well. These are just a few of the many events the Kansas City Convention and Entertainment Facilities offers our community. To learn about even more events, visit kcconvention.com and click on the events calendar or call 816-513-5000. Participating in Soul Smart has been a real benefit to Kansas City in a number of ways. We have done a lot of activities in recent years to make it easier to install solar energy systems on the rooftops uh, of commercial and residential buildings. 
SoulSmart uh, enables us to get some recognition for the work that we've done. Kansas City is committed to solar energy because it's one of our basic tenants that the council and I have adopted. We want to be environmentally conscious. We want to be good stewards of the environment. We also want to make efficient use of all of our energy sources. One of the solar energy projects that I'm fascinated by is the solar energy project out at Kauffman Stadium, which is a collaboration between the Kansas City Royals and KCPNL. I think that is a great example of public-private partnerships that can be used as an example for other uh, institutions. Kansas City and a number of other communities were recently recognized as being goal level solar ready communities. The fascination with crime scene investigation has been on the rise since TV shows like CSI Las Vegas, Miami, and New York have made forensic science so interesting. We're going to take you to the crime lab of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department to show you what the trail of evidence really looks like from start to finish. Linda Netzel is director of the Regional Criminalistics Division and explains why the role of the crime lab is so important to investigations. We want to be able to establish for a judge or a jury that we've taken all of the necessary precautions and care to ensure that the item that was found at the crime scene was handled properly, analyzed properly, and is in relatively the same condition as when we found it. The other reason is the potential for contamination. It's imperative that we be able to prove that we've handled it professionally and in a very um, specific manner to ensure that all of the analysis we ultimately do makes it into the courtroom. The first step involves technicians who are called to a scene to collect evidence. Netzel says it takes a trained eye to determine what might have happened and gather all the items related to the crime. The difficulty of that job is how physical it is and how mentally taxing it can be because basically you're walking into an environment where you don't know necessarily what took place. You just know that the outcome was that a crime occurred. And it's your job to tr try and critically think through what few facts you do have to determine what things at the crime scene may be important. And this can be extremely challenging, especially in a large crime scene or in a crime scene that uh, is in uh, an extent of disarray where there's so much stuff you're not sure what's really important and what isn't. Behind Whatever right is collected is, the is then brought to the crime lab and cataloged for processing. System. So when a scientist asks for an item of evidence, it's Robin's job to make sure that item of evidence gets put into the locker and then on the other side of this wall, the criminalist or the scientist will have uh, They'll be told that it's ready and available and then they can come to the other side of the locker, gain access to the item of evidence and take it to their lab for analysis. Everything is carefully handled by a select number of individuals. We have facial recognition into what's called the CSI vault and only certain people are enrolled in this facial recognition system. Only certain people in the lab can get in there. Uh, crime scene investigators, myself, quality assurance manager and management people, and the rest of the staff are not allowed access to this facility. And preserved for possible trial, and it's nothing like what's shown on TV. So what you tend to see on TV that's not realistic is all of the documentation that has to be done. Basically what you see on TV is, oh, we threw it on the scope, or we threw it in the machine, and out popped the answer and it doesn't demonstrate all of the personnel time spent uh, analyzing and documenting everything about that item of evidence. Other types of evidence like these shoe prints on a glass are dusted, measured, photographed, and lifted from the surface with a special adhesive. 
Firearms also undergo a special process for lifting of fingerprints and DNA using a type of superglue in a special chamber before they are fired in the indoor range or water tank for ballistics testing. Crime lab staff are constantly reviewing and testing thousands of pieces of evidence that may or may not be used in a courtroom. Netzel says that's one of the biggest challenges. So for example, if we have a homicide that occurs and we start working on that homicide and two days later we have another homicide, that's, that new homicide may have some sense of, uh, of urgency or some urgency around it because the suspects are at large. So we have to constantly make changes to our priorities dependent on what is the threat to the community we serve. If you are interested in a career in forensics, the crime lab is always looking for good scientists. Get more information on how to apply on our website at kcpd.org. I'm Sergeant Matt Fisher. Have a safe week. Fall is a great time for neighborhood cleanups and now your neighborhood group can dispose of old tires for free. The amnesty collections are usually held the first Saturday of each month. This fall, the city is adding extra dates to provide extra cleanup opportunities. Neighborhood organizations can drop off tires at the city's environmental campus at 4707 Doremus on either October 15th, November 5th, or November 19th. Additionally, tire trailers will be placed in two neighborhoods, Marlboro on October 15th and Historic Northeast on October 29th. The city's annual America Recycles event will also be held on November 5th. That's at Manual Tech Career Center, which is 1320 Truman Road, and that's from 8 a.m. to noon. Residents can bring tires as well as paint, small appliances, electronics, building materials, and clothing. This is an annual recycling event. For additional information about these tire events, go to kcmo.gov and search tires. Now, speaking of fall cleanup, the city's fall curbside leaf and brush pickup program begins in the south zone the week of October 24th. Collection moves to the central zone the week of October 31st through November 4th, and Northland residents can set out their leaves and brush the week of November 14th. A second round of collections runs from late November through mid-December. Please remember that you may leave up to 20 bags or bundles of leaves and brush on the curb on your regular trash day. The city's leaf and brush drop-off sites are also now open. The sites are located at 11660 North Main, 1815 North Shoto Trafficway, and 10301 Raytown Road. Drop-off is free to residents on Saturdays with identification. For more information about leaf and brush, visit kcmo.gov and search leaf and brush. Uh, due to the Veterans Day holiday on Friday, November 11th, trash pickup for residents whose regular trash day is on Fridays will have their trash picked up on Saturday, November 12th. That does it for this edition of the Weekly Report. To view this program again or other Channel 2 videos, go to kcmo.gov and search Channel 2. That page has a link to our YouTube channel and all of our great programs that you can view on demand. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Hernandez. Have a great week.